is we're going to talk kind of a little bit about um, the, the history of artificial intelligence, how um, we've kind of had these step functions to get to where we are today, um, and then we'll talk about the infrastructure ecosystem and then get into uh, investing and, and where you see opportunities. So I will uh, try and stay out of the way and let you two brilliant uh, minds kind of take us through this. Um, but Bill, I guess if we could start with you, um, please tell us your, your background, how you got into uh, big data, um, what kind of consulting work you do, and, um, and, and what you find so fascinating about this field. Yeah, so my back, <laughs> put it down like this, that's a good quality microphone there. Um, my background is in, uh, no surprise, analytics, data science, now of course AI has fallen into that category. And I always joke, you know, I started out back when you got a statistics degree and you weren't sure what you're gonna do with it and lucked into going into the business world to do analytics before it was a thing. Um, so I spent a lot of years in various types of consulting. Uh, my longest stint where I really started to get into uh, the bigger picture of this stuff was a, a, you know, from a company called Teradata. It was a couple billion dollar public company. I was their chief analytics officer for a couple of years and got to travel around the world and talk to all these large companies back in the area of big data. So to tie this to AI, I always, would talk to clients and I, and I wrote about how I thought big data was misnamed because it implied that the big was the important part of it. And it wasn't that there, there weren't challenges, but it was, big data wasn't about more transactional data, more ERP data, et cetera. It was fundamentally different data. It was sensor data. It was for the first time text and so forth. And that opened up new business problems you could solve that had previously not been addressable. And that was the real important thing about big data. It, it was really different. It, uh, the differentness rather than the bigness. And I think AIs follow a similar thing, what I'll call legacy AI, the AI that took things by storm until a year ago, image recognition and things like that, you took what were really the classic approaches, like I'm gonna predict whether someone will or won't buy, and applied it to a new type of data, I'm gonna predict whether this image has a cat or doesn't have a cat, as an example. And so it was some of the same types of problems against new data, which had value, and AI had a, a nice hype cycle. But generative AI has blown up in the last year because it's kind of a mix of that big data thing. Generative AI is now creating new data. That's the difference. We're not classifying an existing piece of data, an existing image or an existing customer. You're generating a new example of an image or a new example of an article, and that is just fundamentally different. And it opens up all kinds of things that just simply weren't possible. So anyway, that's why I think uh, you know, kind of how AI started to take off and how generative AI blew up in part because it's just doing some fundamentally different things that we've never seen before. And people are still trying to figure out how to do these. Well, Regina, please, before you, you talk uh, too much about your technical expertise, um, tell us a little about you, how you and Rick started your, your company, and um, how you fell into uh, AI. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Measure the mind based on Bill's experience, but um, fundamentally, uh, my background has been at the cross section of investing and in tech. Um, started actually as a liberal arts graduate out of Wellesley College, so big fan of people who can ask questions, you can learn the the outcomes. But um, and um, landing on in tech by way of working for Frank Quatron, and the name still rings a bell, in investment banking in 2000 through that dot com bubble and burst a lot of lessons but gained a love for tech, and then post HBS, where I got, Harvard Business School, where I got my MBA, I joined Microsoft, started on their, um, getting their investments and acquisitions on their consumer side, so if you have kids who, you know, are, do games like Halo and whatnot, don't blame the likes of me too much, <laughs> but, and then quickly moved to enterprise, and have been an enterprise investor ever seen, enterprise encompassing B2B and security in my world. Um, and then in mid-2000s, left Microsoft to join an early stage of first capital in generalist tech firm in Boston, where I and my now co-founder at the current firm, Glasswing Ventures, led investments with the application, with a focus on the application of frontier tech for enterprise and cybersecurity, very much thesis oriented. And um, around the 2006 time frame, we started noticing something was changing. And I will sort of build on some of the uh, notes and thoughts that Bill shared, which were uh, that we were moving, in fact, at least in academia, and we saw this in, occurred in industry in 2010, from this notion of big data to something else. 
and that something else was actually an algorithmic driver in addition to the veracity, diversity, and size of data that was emerging as a result of initially the web, the whole digital footprint was a new type of data set, then mobile, then IoT. So as that was happening in parallel, i.e. a lot more data available in all of us and any of us collectively and individually, we can talk about the, the challenges around that, but um, what happened algorithmically is that we shifted from this notion of classical machine learning to deep learning. All right, I've thrown the term, so let me take that back. Um, up to 2006, any notion of machine learning, so if you think about AI as the what, let's undo some definitions, i.e. you have software, whether it's purely software or you know, manifesting itself in a device, but fundamentally you have software and algorithms mimicking human-like intelligence. That's AI, it has nothing to do with human brains, so we're not even gonna talk about it, but the output mimics human-like intelligence. If that is the what, the how of how it gets done, it's you know, three drivers, ability to compute it, so you need a lot of computational power, data, and algorithms. <coughs> Up to 2006, we were doing this notion of classical machine learning, a data set, relatively simple, a pretty linear function, uh, k-means for clustering, regression for price prediction, that's actually a form of artificial intelligence, and pretty clear outputs. 2006, out of University of Toronto, um, we get what's known as deep learning or neural nets, where you have this much, much more diverse types of data sets, not just in size, again, but also in the types of data and complexity and not often not well-defined, that are no longer going through just a linear or very simple algorithm, but going through these complex algorithms that have nodes. And again, we love to humanize this thing, so you know, think of them as neural nets, kind of like the human brain. It does not work that way, I will repeat it. But there are all these nodes in the algorithms that this data goes through, very complex, very powerful, which in turn give you incredibly you know, powerful um, outcomes that we have previously never seen, and I'm sure we'll get into examples. So back to what I do for a living as a venture capitalist and an early stage one at that, you see that and you say, oh my goodness, you know, I'm, this is driven, this is going to cut across everything we do, so how do I apply it against the enterprise and security markets and within those, the thesis that I have in each of those markets. With that conviction, um, in 2016, after we built a whole portfolio of AI and companies, we spun out, we and my co-founder, by we and myself and my co-founder, Rick Grinnell, to launch Glasswing Ventures. Um, did that separation, full attribution, carried our portfolio with us, um, and then 17 started fundraising, early 18 we announced our first fund of $112 million, 22 our oversubscribed second fund of $158 million, and we're continuing to build from there. So if you take anything from what I just shared, AI is actually a, not a monolithic notion, it's, it's a huge combination of different techniques, uh, whether it's classical or um, deep learning. And it's, uh, in fact, 70 years in the making, so I joke that it's an overnight phenomenon, 70 years in the making. We can talk about why all of us are caring about it at a mass consumer level now, but this has been a journey, um, and capital has been you know, returned and several fold over, and now it's with the opportunity it's even bigger knowing how to differentiate AI native versus checking the box AI. Well, thank you, wonderful. Um, so let's talk about uh, the ecosystem, um, and, and especially, well, I guess we'll start at the bottom. Uh, we'll start with the infrastructure. How has um, cloud storage, and how has computing power advances uh, impacted uh, this field? I, I think uh, this gets back to the you know, why now? Uh, ironically, some of the, let's say, the theoretical foundations of everything that you're seeing the outcome of today were actually defined and, and existed for a number of years. The challenge was, in some cases, there, there wasn't the data or there wasn't the cost-effective way to actually store and process that data. So I think we, we've had kind of a confluence of, of many different things in the, in the technology realm that developed. So things like the graphics processing units that 
which while originally built to render graphics, ended up being really good for these kinds of complicated computations. The cloud where you could rent the space um, as needed doesn't mean it's cheap to run these models, but what it means is I don't have to go buy $2 million of hardware, run this big model, then what do I do with my $2 million when I'm done? I can just rent it. So it, we've started to have things where it, 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 it makes it more uh, cost effective, concurrent with the collection of the better data. I, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but you know when you do those little captures and you have to pick every bridge in the picture and hit submit, that's actually training AI. This, this isn't just a security thing. When you click that, you're either confirming or not confirming how those images are classified in a database so that they can improve the accuracy of the database on which the models are trained. And so we had CAPTCHAs for years before all this AI stuff hit. That's because that's the effort it took to get the data. You need an image that's tagged. This image has a cat, it has a bridge, it has a whatever, as an example. Um, and that's a very expensive and time consuming thing if you were to just go out and say, let's go build that database. And so there's been this whole ecosystem of both technology and then even that forethought of, how about if we insert something that will help with security to, to break bots, but will also give us uh, good training data. So I've always been, been intrigued by the idea that, uh, that everybody's actually been involved in making this happen, even though most people don't realize it. And, and to build on that point, fundamentally, we could have had the, the richness of data that we both touched on. We could have had even the algorithmic breakthroughs. But then to sort of come back to your question, if we didn't have the computational pa power and in a cheaper, better, faster, i.e. if we didn't have public clouds, AWS, Google, you know, for Amazon, GCP for Google, um, Azure for Microsoft, etc., we wouldn't be talking about AI today. Now, so three drivers, data algorithms and, um, and computation, cheaper computation, at least to, to get started, um, and then it gets more complex thereafter. Now, why, why AI today? Why not five years ago or five years from now? Within the field of machine learning, back to the how, um, you know, there was a reference made to generative AI, so we waited for five minutes before we actually <laughs> threw the term. Um, generative AI is actually the combination of two types of deep learning architectures, namely um, attention and um, embeddings, which is in the feedforward architecture. So you just have the lingo, ignore it, but just so that you have the facts. Um, what happened is these large language models were developed, um, and their performance which is all statistics driven, make a mental note of that, there is no reasoning capability embedded in these models, none. There is no extrapolation capability, none. But the output fundamentally shifted how we interact, the user experience and user interface with software going forward. Because what it did is with being trained on huge amounts of data, these models deliver outputs in terms of how they interact or respond to our queries that is very human-like. Um, my standing joke, let's see how well it lands, is that you know a technology has crossed the mass consumerization stage when, I have a 10-year-old, so I always refer to her, uh, when my 10-year-old wants to cut corners and look up the answer on ChatGPT and maybe it can write the essay, maybe mama won't catch it, uh, forgets mama does it for a living, or grandma wants to hug now the iPad because on ChatGPT it was so funny, right? All of a sudden you have the, the generational barbell size, you go, aha, this has crossed you know, the chasm. And the reason why is fundamentally that the interaction feels very human-like and it fools us into believing that we're um, interacting with a reasoning entity when we are not but extremely powerful. I also want to emphasize that that's only a facet, and a pretty narrow at it, of what's happening around AI. And it's both great because it brings AI to the forefront, and great because if you're an investor and you're focusing on that, and other areas where people who are just jumping on the bandwagon, whether it's investments or starting companies, are just coming up the curve, you can go in at you know, arbitrage valuations. But that's just for my big job. Thank you. Um, so let's uh, let's pivot to the difference between um, open source and proprietary models. Um, now some of these companies are coming out with uh, like like OpenAI, for instance. Uh, it seems like anybody can go out and grab one of these foundational models and start using it for for their own purposes. 
is there a benefit to spending money uh, to build your own proprietary systems, or should you be layering on top of some of this open source software? So, um, if I may re recast your question so we know where it fits in the bigger picture. So, foundation models are the infrastructure layer or the bottom layer above hardware, above the silica, or this sliver of AI called generative AI. Um, so, what's happening with these models is they're very, very big, so they're horizontal models, and they fundamentally take have ingested large amounts of data, they create new synthetic data by way of their answers, and at least initially it was text to text, now you can input text and get images, and over time 3D and video, so it's called multimodal, but they become the backbone of anything that you build, whether it's user interface for this facet of AI and beyond. <coughs> Hunter's question pertains to, oh my gosh, like every day we read about the key players in this space, and it's OpenAI, which is now 49% owned by Microsoft. It's Anthropic in Canada, which is largely owned by Salesforce and Oracle and a bunch of other players. Google going with its own um, model. And they're all proprietary, walled garden type approaches. And then on the other side, you have what's open source, which are these models that are not you know, held closely in a proprietary model. The code is out there and everyone contributes. I would say, I don't know this for a fact, but if I dare to speculate, 70 plus percent of the mind share in mass media and what we read is focused on open AI because they're the ones to have first created this ChatGPT app, so it's the manifestation of a large language model or that you can interact with and therefore kind of get a sense of what we're talking about. Um, that's a proprietary model. The challenge with proprietary versus open source is proprietary, you control the code, if you have a move first mover advantage and all the things that you think about. The challenges around it, there is actually no moat around it because it's been trained on general data, raw data. It's, um, it's extremely capital intensive, but it's not so far advanced that other players cannot catch up. Furthermore, um, based on the experience that the technology industry has seen around the cloud and the sort of the lock-in challenges, you know, there is deep concern around making one's enterprise or data visible to open AI. So there are real concerns around privacy and how your data and then competitive advantage are is being used. So this one person is of the view that open source is going to have an incredible year this year. It's no mistake, for example, that Meta and Facebook, their models are completely open source. It's no mistake that Amazon um, is taking a middle of the road, it's using open source, they're gonna try to be the integrator, the Swiss Army knife for all of this. But fundamentally, long term, it is unclear that these first movers have a mode that can defend and they're going to become the winners. One, because they're largely owned by incumbents. So, so much for that. Two, because they're being trained on the same types of data that the other models, so they don't have necessarily a data advantage. They have an early adopter advantage, but you can get caught up. And thirdly, because we have yet to see a killer app that's a must have that gets adopted in um, enterprise. So I'll pause. So I'll kind of reframe it a little bit. I, that, that was a great explanation, like the, the, the literal question, open source versus proprietary. Let me frame it slightly different, a foundational model versus the applications on top. So even ChatGPT, for example, is an application through which you interface with an underlying model, which, for example, like GPT-4 is one of them. The point is, there's the models themselves. And to build a foundational model, whether it's an open source foundational model or open AI's foundational model, massive amount of investment and money, and in reality, they're largely commoditized already. I mean, I, it's an inelegant comparison, but I like to liken it to an operating system on your phone, right? You can get iOS, you can get Android on your PC. You might have Apple, you might have Windows. It's not that there aren't some differences, but fundamentally, they're gonna let you do the same things. No one goes and builds their own operating system. What you do is you customize what kind of apps you put on those operating systems to get value. I think that's the big thing here. Any company that's thinking of building its own foundational models, whether they want to keep it proprietary or open source, I don't see that working out uh, very well. They're largely commoditized. The value is in, like some of the work we're doing at the university is with um, one of the major insurance companies. 
you take those those foundational models that are generic and then you fine tune it on documents and information from your industry so that it learns your language in the case of a language model. So like umbrella. The term umbrella in everyday English as we would use it is very different from the context of umbrella in an insurance context where you have things like umbrella insurance. And so some of the work we're doing is if you train the model on all these documents from this insurance company, will it effectively give answers and recognize this umbrella context because it's asked in context of your business versus starting to talk about the thing you uh, that you hold up in the rain. So that anyway, that's what that's what I encourage you to look at is this idea of tweaking the model for your business and you'll have to rent, you'll still be paying a fee like utility to that underlying model. But I think the big value for both companies and if I was a startup, I'm building something that adds value on top of the foundation and much like an operating system, I'm just gonna assume that the foundations are gonna be well taken care of in one way or another between the open source and proprietary things open today. And if I may continue building on that, and as you stretch into the investment world and you have a dollar and you say in this, what we love, like would call that a technology stack, I have my software infrastructure, I have my middleware, and I have the applications that you're advocating for, and I only invest in the application layer, so I will double down on that advocacy. Um, you say, where do I put it? You know, well, go on a, you know, a dollar of Microsoft stock, you've got a, plenty of exposure. So if you have that, you already have got the exposure. But fundamentally, the way that this tax stack will shape up is you'll have this commoditized layer eventually, then you will have your own small language model or you'll fine tune it. This will likely be proprietary to the technology company or you know, tech-enabled business and then on top of it you will have the application and that's where value starts to be created and if this is too theoretical look at what happened with the cloud because it took a very similar journey for the two or three or four players that you have as public clouds amazon google microsoft that will lesser extent ibm and others you know and therefore SaaS came about right that was all as a result of cloud SaaS companies that became multi-billion dollar companies are orders of magnitude more of those than those three or four or five. So from NetSuite to Salesforce to Workday to CrowdStrike, we were talking about them earlier, like all of these companies that are SaaS, you know, from day one. Similarly with AI, and I also come back to do not get caught too much on this Gen AI alone. I would love for, for all of us to expand our view because there's a lot that's happening. But on the tech stack and where one makes bets, I think we're resoundingly in agreement that it's the application layer that's solving real problems where you can have an AI advantage that you protect. Yeah, and I want to parrot something she said too, which is generative AI, it's exciting, but I agree with her 100%. It's, it's one facet, and whatever value it has, there's so much work being done back to, you know, using AI to classify, predict, et cetera, just on different types of data, even in some of the traditional things, like you're gonna build a credit score, you're gonna predict pricing. Some of these uh, architectures that the AI models use are starting to show some, some real capability to compete with, and in some cases, outperform those uh, traditional models. So it, AI as, a, as an entire category, it's much broader than just generative AI. And in a way, I'm, I'm glad that generative AI is what kind of helped it everything move forward, but I think in the last year at least, it feels like people are, are making a one-to-one -one association between AI and generative AI. And it's just important to remember generative AI is that one, one category, an important one, but one category of AI and value prop for AI. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so let's pivot to uh, risk uh, and data management. Um, I know that coming into this year, it's an election year, um, staying on generative AI, hopefully not too long, but um, you know, I, I, what are your concerns about uh, this, this content generation? Um, what are your concerns about there being a trillion gigabytes of data every day being manufactured? And, and who's capturing that? Who's, who's uh, data squatting? You know, that was a term that you taught me, Regina, which I really like. Um, how, how should be people be looking at uh, the management of this, this massive amount of data, the privacy concerns, and any risks uh, in, in, ge in generative AI, whether good or bad, because there are some positive use cases for generative AI, not just um, the, the political risks that you might uh, touch on. So I'll, I'll, I'll give a very, let's say, general public 
risk, and then I'll give more of a um, business model risk. So general public risk, I, I, I think it was just yesterday I put out my monthly blog and I did predictions for the year, and one of them was that deep fakes are finally gonna cause a huge mess sometime this year, tied to some election somewhere. I first thought that was gonna happen a couple of years ago, and, and, and it just it didn't. I'm actually still stunned by this. Um, but back to everything's so cheap now, there are so many services that you can go out with just a couple of images and you know a few, a few seconds to a minute or two of audio of someone and make a convincing deep fake that you know, pretty soon, uh, you know, I always say for years, our whole lives, we learned that sometimes you can't always believe what you read, you need to validate. But if you saw it or heard it, you can take it to the bank. If you saw a video of me saying something, you can take it to the bank, I did it. That's just not true anymore. So my one prediction for the year will be somebody in an election somewhere, a candidate, when it's a tight race, right before election, a deep fake will come out, torpedo them and they lose, and it'll be proven a deep fake a, 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 a little bit too late. So I think we need to have penalties like the identity theft equivalent. But now let's spin this around. There's good uses for this as well. So image recognition models notoriously weren't effective across a, a, both a wide range of you know skin colors, hairstyles, uh, et cetera, or imagine angles and lighting. So this sounds crazy, but one thing that they've had success with is generating, taking a few pictures of me and then generating say a thousand other fake images from different angles with different lighting combinations, different hairstyles. And while those are fake images of me, it actually used as training data will make that model do much better at recognizing the real me in the real world. And it's not cost effective. I sit here all day taking 10,000 pictures with all those different uh, different layers. So this is back to where I believe technology is, as it is the age old thing. I don't believe that even deep fake, that that's the negative use of the generative technology, but there, there's good uses. And then the last, the systemic risk we all have is there's no good way today to identify fake, documents created or images from the real ones. And all this talk of watermarking and such, for everybody that comes up with it, they readily acknowledge it's easily breakable if someone's a bad actor. So if you go look up this concept called model collapse, this one freaked me out when I saw it about three months ago. So any statistical model, think of that classic bell curve you learned in college, right? When you build a model, it's gonna trim the extremes by definition. Every model, you, you won't predict quite at the extremes. Same thing's gonna happen, generative AI has foundational statistics under it. So here's where this gets problematic. If we generate a bunch of fake images from real training data, but then we use those generated images as training data over time, we've lost some of the variation in the original things that they've done studies. Over time, for example, you'll lose all of it. So if we don't find an effective way to keep track of the real human generated text, images, video, et cetera, from all the stuff we're already generating, literally within a few years, uh, after a number of iterations of these models, it'll be useless. It'll be like that crazy person. It'll have one word answer to everything. There's examples where every picture comes out, basically a blurry nothing, because it's lost all the variation because we fed in these images that while they look really good to us initially, aren't quite as variant, but then they create Owens that are similarly the next round, not quite as variant, and you just, it's a, it's a doomed spiral. So that's, I think, the biggest systemic risk we have to deal with or else the, this entire class of models could become almost useless over a period of years. I don't think that'll happen, but I'm just saying that's why it's such a urgent. So um, as I think about risk, first of all, inherent risk, all technology is good or bad. It just is. It's about how we put it to use. So before we turn technology into an angel or demonize it, I think recognizing that is, you know, in whose hands are we putting the technologies is a fundamental question. Um, also, there's a lot of noise that, uh, back into the 30,000 foot level <coughs> before about um, AI destroying us all and uh, you know creating self-awareness. You can't reason like it's so basic at certain levels that you know if we dare to worry about three, four, five, six hundred years from now, I suspect there will be a lot bigger risks before we ever got if it got there. So let, let me put that to rest. I think the more immediate and fundamental risks are around identity and security, are around data privacy and how it gets used, and then um, seeing you know, being no longer believing because of what we can generate with this notion of what's called synthetic data, data that looks real or a picture that looks, image that looks real but is not. So what that means for in my world is that 
AI can be part of the problem, but also part of the solution. For example, I have an investment in my portfolio on the security side called Name Tag. And what it does, its entire existence is actually tying um, physical identities with digital identities to ensure that the image or the person is who they say they are. Um, and that's on the footprint and then that individual opts in. So that's leveraging AI for good so that if you, if a wealth advisor is receiving a call from a client and the voice verification has been tricked, you can do that now. And sort of all the compliance layers that you have, um, you know, have been bypassed and it's very easy to do. You send a phishing, uh, you send a phishing email saying I'm Rudina and I'm Hunter's client. It looks like from my email address how often does, sorry Hunter, I'm dumping this on you. He click when it looks like it's the right address to notice, oh my gosh, there is an extra letter embedded in the middle that I missed in that long email. Um, so he clicks on it, it says, hey Hunter, I'd like to initiate a wire, I'm making this investment, da 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 da. He sends it to his folks, you know, there is a call verification that they initiate. They have already sort of somehow, if they've figured out this relationship, most likely I have been compromised in my accounts. So they know to perhaps, you know, run through the call, so they're the ones that intercept the call get to receive the call, there's a voice recognition like your fidelity, fidelity relies heavily on voice recognition, you can spoof that, you've got them to the account. So you follow the two separate, all those joys, and, and still not being able to, to overcome that challenge. So therefore, now verifications need to be multi-layered, and you need to do them in fairly real time if you're delivering that white glove for, uh, you know, service. So, you see an opportunity where there is uh, vulnerability, there is opportunity for leveraging AI, multifaceted type of data to deliver an outcome. So that's an example well that while AI might create issues, we can also leverage it to be part of the answer. All the way to, I wanna bring it back to sort of real world examples. Um, I'll speak to a company that's actually in, in Canada, I'm trying to debate that there's also one in here, but I'll go with base two. So I don't know how many of you have exposure to pharma, chemical, oil and gas, but think of the industries that are compound driven. Little known fact, or maybe well known, but I wasn't aware before we developed our thesis on this, that compounds produced at scale, actually the formulas deviate, like they're not identical. In fact, let's just say we don't take any medication, we just take vitamins because we're that healthy, from bottle of vitamin, from batch to batch of the same vitamin, it's not identical in composition. Here we are gene editing, but we can't get that right because at scale, compounds behave differently. Well, if you're doing this in a run-of-the-mill software model or pen and paper or Excel, you can see how it hits a cap from a process engineering point of view. Well, there is a whole facet of machine learning now, in a particular one type of architecture called PINs, Physics Informed Neural Nets, which basically captures the laws of the physical world, whether it's physics, whether it's um, chemistry, biology, what have you, and is able to model it, including the variations at scale. So how it changes and how it maps. So imagine you are now J and J, um, or Merck or one of those, GSK, one of those companies. First of all, you know, one batch process for XYZ vitamin, let's just take for my example, is typically 20 to 40 million runs. So nothing, you know, you, you gotta take it seriously. And you are running it for the maximum amount of time because you need to comply with all the regulations and you don't know the optimal time. Well, what if I put forth now a software solution where you don't need any coding or you know Python or PyTorch type language experience, you can just interact with it in plain English because that interface of generative AI. That's where generative AI begins and ends for this company. Nice interface, but that's about it. But you're leveraging this facet of machine learning and AI around pins um, and recurrent neural net architectures, so at whatever scale it can give you the optimal time. On average, this company now in, in industry is delivering about 40% cost savings. And fascinating, it's around energy savings because it's so expensive because you no longer need to run it for 20 hours. You can actually run it for a lot less to hit the optimal time and not surpass it and give you a lot more accuracy. So when Bill and I talk about application layer, this is exactly what we're talking about, I think, which is 
go leverage AI native products that deliver a value that previously could not be done without AI, otherwise you're doing AI for the sake of AI and that we win or does not make, go solve a very big problem with a very big budget and go become a winner, execution and all else holding. Okay. That went far away from security. I love it, I love it, thank you. Um, so let's talk a little about monetization. Um, you know, you were kind of educating me on Llama 2 and, and what Meta's rollout has. Sorry about that. Um, it's a challenge not coordinating with AI. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry about that, my apologies. <laughs> something that Meta can capture initially right away in their profitability? How soon can, um, can that be a, uh, uh, quantified in terms of the bottom line? Are, are these models seeing the, a scalable uh, monetization? Um, we can <coughs> talk a little about the profitability of this, this recent AI boom. I mean, when it comes to some, something like uh, the cloud providers, for example, every time anybody runs a query against with ChatGPT, somebody's making money because that's using processing CPU and someone's paying for that. So if you subscribe, if you have a subscription service to ChatGPT, which a lot of people already have today, that's what that's going to pay for. And so it gets back to my, I think my analogy about thinking of a lot of these models as a foundational and any utility. I think the, you know, it's not that there's not gonna be a ton of money made by the people who own the utility models, just like the utilities make a ton of money off our electric usage and our cell phones still make money off of us, even though they're just serving a tactical service. Um, the question is, how is there room for a whole wide range of players offering those utilities? I think like in most things like this, we'll just end up with a, a, a handful that really dominate, much like the cloud did, much like cell service does, much like airlines do. And the chance of it not being one of the big players over time, I think, is just you know relatively small. So Facebook has the infrastructure and the and the, the reach with consumers to, to to probably make theirs work. Obviously, Amazon because they own so much cloud probably gets gets theirs to work. I don't want to be Bill's um, you know Bill's foundational model company hosted by Amazon and think that I'm somehow going to you know out compete on that. So uh, the, back to it. I think the money for Everybody that's not already a big player is in, is in these apps and making something useful on top. I think the utilities are almost already a foregone, in my mind at least, a foregone conclusion. Though, I mean, like anything, I could be thinking about some disruption could come, but that's, if I had to bet the dollar today, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, and I'll build on that. So Lama is um, Meta's or Facebook's um, model for this foundational layer, and, um, and like, I, like I said, it's open source, so they're not, um, keeping it in a proprietary fashion. I'm, I'm going to play conspiracy theorist here for a second. I'm going to say that they have realized um, that it's a commodity. So, you know, they can afford to have it, they can enrich it. So then you ask the question do I go and try to take something that's commodity and make it valuable? how they've already captured it at the social level and all the other things that they're doing, or do I open source it and completely cut my competitors at, you know, at their knee if I can get my performance to, to be that. In case it has gotten lo lost, OpenAI spent $700,000 a day on compute. Did I say that again? $700,000 a day. And you can do that, you know, if you wanted to be a loss leader, if you had a clear competitive advantage that you could retain as a first mover and a mode. But if you're doing that, you've got to find ways to monetize it. And if you're trying to find ways to monetize it, you're going to charge the enterprises. And enterprises will pay for this, whether it's open source for someone to sort of make it enterprise grade, or whether it's proprietary. In fact. I think of it as if you look at the PNL of a chief um, information officer, so not the, invest the CIO, but not the investment, the information or CTO, in their budget of fixed variable costs, so it's a fixed line, <coughs> but of variable costs, you have cloud, 
because it's usage-based, and now you're gonna have foundational models, for sure here to stay. But, but, if you don't have a competitive advantage as someone is giving it for free, how well are you going to fare? It is therefore very logical as to why the backers of these large foundational models are not your usual VCs, names you know and don't know, are the large incumbents. Because every time we have seen this movie, it has been an incumbents game where ability to move as fast is inhibited by their size, but capital on a relative basis feels almost infinite. You know, OpenAI is raising again, in case you don't know, you know, they just raised a few months ago. Anthropic is raising again. Um, you know, in Europe, um, French, I'm like in um, Rwanda, whatever the name is, um, I'll come to me in a sec. Um, they just closed a gigantic multi billion dollar round. And again, it's because it's computationally so intensive. So, with no, comp you know, huge edge on competition and performance. So, I think Llama is actually a, I'm gonna cut my competition at their knees, I'm gonna deliver it, I'm gonna own for my own domains the application layer, and these guys can, can try to figure out, you know, where is on better as they struggle for capital. One person's view. And I'll tie this to kind of an evolution that's happened over the years of data science. So if, I, if you go back, it's shocking. Big, big data is barely 10 to 12 years ago that it even started. So even back then, almost everything done in the world of analytics, it was SaaS and SQL. And SaaS obviously was a proprietary software. SQL was just a language, but every every vendor had their had their own flavor. And then over time, all of a sudden, like R and Python in my field, these took off. Uh, first R and now Python. So. Ironically, as soon as R kind of took over, now suddenly it was a couple of years and, and Python's there. Where I'm heading with this is, so where's money getting made? No one's really making money uh, as much as they used to, just selling a, a language that lets you interact with the data. Those have been commoditized and there's open source software. To some degree, even the databases themselves, I mean, if you look at you know, uh, 12, 15 years ago when I was at Teradata, we were just and going in our heyday because everyone was buying databases. Well, there's open source versions out there now that in many cases, I always say good enough. That's what's hurting the market. They're good enough. They're not as good as a commercial product, but if you look at it and say, can I get what I need using this free stuff and save this over here, I'm willing to, to trade it off. That's not true every time, but it's true enough that it causes problems. So where this all comes back, it's the same kind of thing. Regardless of whether um, uh, I'm, what I'm interacting with, someone has to store that data, someone has to do the processing. Those utilities are gonna make that money. When I have an app on top of that, an interface, today there's still companies like Salesforce, et cetera, CRM applications making a ton of money. Those applications, you're paying the fee because they know how to interact with all these underlying things effectively so you don't have to worry about it. So it's the same kind of thing. You've got the foundation, you've got an application layer, and in the middle, some of these other pieces, there's not a lot of money to be made. I think that, that, that that's kind of, in, in my mind, the same kind of thing I'm, I'm seeing here. Amazon and, and, and the disk makers, the CPU makers, they're gonna make a killing as long as cloud's booming because they're gonna get a fee on everything, albeit a very tactical fee, and the highly value-added apps on top will make money, but having the programming language, having the foundation model, et cetera, in and of itself, is, is, is it's in that weird thing that these days I just don't think there's money there. And we have concentrated the, the mind share of this um, exchange amongst the three of us on the algorithms and the infrastructure for the algorithms. I think it's perhaps worth pausing for a second on the data side and the data infrastructure, the data backbone, because algorithms be damned, if, you know, it's the data that you're feeding into it and, and the outcome that affects the outcome and their performance. Now, managing the data backbone, which you could theoretically think a bit of as an infrastructure type layer, albeit it is not, that in my view is a huge opportunity um, because it's not owned by anyone, it's not a utility inherently in nature, and it runs the gamut from how do I, you know, Amazon will charge me X, Y, Z at scale that's incredibly expensive, so immediately the focus is how do I bring my costs down? Well, um, there are now all sorts of approaches and companies, like I have one called Chaos Search, that's focusing on how you can mine your data cheaper, better, faster by de developing a new type of database. There are opportunities and a lot of money to be made in those types of categories. Or in my latest fund, I have a company called Featurebyte, 
So um, I don't know, by the way, when we say we have the algorithm, we have the data, we feed the data, output, you know, out comes the output, you know, as my daughter said, hold your horses. Getting the data ready to be usable, and I'm sure you'll have something to say about this, it's an incredibly expensive and laborious affair. You gotta get, in enterprise, in a business, you gotta get your data scientists to first get the data, then to add what's called features and get the feature ready. You know, if you're, if you're gonna tie data around my identity, okay, you might have my name and you might have my age, but you need to legally and compliantly buy or find out, you know, other data that's features added to me, my age, marital status, children, no children, career, income, all that, so that's expensive in, in and of their own. The data scientists have got to put that together. It's a pretty labor-intensive process. Then you got to turn it over to your data developers and the engineering team, and they have X, you know, this is priority. So that's another few weeks. So all of a sudden, it's taken you multiple months, beginning to end, to get that data ready for use to feed into your algorithm to get to the output. <coughs> so there, I see opportunity for productivity. So. Uh, like I said, we have an investment in, uh, in a company called Feature Buy. They have taken that whole process and automated it. It's a team, the initial team out of Data Robot, if you're familiar with that company. So what took multiple months, you can do in five minutes. There is a patent and IP advantage there. There is a performance advantage coming back to where is your mode, you know, performance, tech, and all of a sudden you have brought down the cost of the data infrastructure by way of time, people hard costs as well as how much data you need to uh, get this end-to-end -end operating in a short amount of time. So I would like to delineate between the foundation models, the algorithm, and the claim that we believe that there might not be an advantage to that utility type nature versus the data and how you need infrastructure piece and how you can get that ready for use. Yeah, and I'll just go on, the screen of the data, you know, even classic, the most Long-standing data still isn't perfect at any major company. Uh, you know, my, my master's capstone, I did a IHG sponsored it last semester, and part of what we had the students focus on was validating uh, the the, uh, the quality. And they they ahead of time posed a few problems where they knew their submissions. And so you'd say, well, how can they not have pristine reservations data when they've been collecting for four years? Well. As you dig into it, there's all kinds of ways that things go wrong. They just acquired a new hotel, and then that hotel, of course, hadn't followed their standards, and then there's things that get misclassified, or someone does a key in error. So something as simple, here was one of the examples we had the students look at. The hotel, let's say the hotel over there, it's typically $200 a night, and now all of a sudden you see some rooms for $2,000 a night. Is that a problem? Is that an error? Very, very well could be. But what if it's, you know, the national championship game is in town or, you know, some other thing. So even you have to, you have to go, to, it's such a more complicated level of analysis to determine is that 2000 legitimate at that moment in time that it exists, even if 99% of the time it would not be legitimate. And now imagine that's just for traditional data. If you can see that little picture over there on the wall, imagine with images now. Is that a, a, a set of clouds? Is it a fuzzy tornado that's been blurred? There's all sorts of things it could be or maybe not be. I don't even know how to identify myself how I would go through the process of deciding if you ask me that question, let alone some way to have it automated today like we do with other kinds of data quality where we can at least look for patterns in numerical data and identify outliers and have someone then adjudicate those. How do I even know what that picture is supposed to be or might represent? Um, and so I think we're at the, at the very front end of even understanding how to manage the quality of things like the images and the video and even the text, the raw, the, you know, the raw text data. Because again, there's proper grammar and then there's how people actually talk and write. And so, yeah, I might have used improper grammar, but maybe everything I said is correct. It doesn't matter I used improper grammar. In some cases, yes. In other cases, not, you know, not at all. So, Anyway, it's a complicated issue. Yeah, I, I'll give a couple of other examples along the same lines to give Atlanta a shout out. So I have a company here called Verison in the MRO space, so maintenance, repair, and operations. Patrick and I were talking earlier. And think about the problem in, in the manufacturing industry, which is it's 60 to $80 billion of hard dollar, not savings in time, but the hard dollar loss that occurs every single year because of poor data um, quality. So particularly around indirect materials. So if you think about a making of a dress, 
The thread is a direct material. The part, the machine that makes the dress is considered indirect, so it's the indirect inputs. Someone has ordered that piece for that machine, that you know, gadget, and uh, the data says that it's not there, when in reality the data that you have in your ERP system is not tied to your physical data, or someone encoded it incorrectly. I mean, there are thousands of possibilities as to why this goes wrong, and therefore you're over-ordering in industries where margins are paper thin, or if you flip it on its head, it says that you have it when in reality you don't. An even bigger problem because you've got to you know, stop the production line and that's millions per hour and all those joys. So in comes Verison. They're, they're leveraging a couple of architectures around deep learning where they can take partially correct alphanumerical inputs, which is what these inputs are as they code every um, SKU, and harmonize it so you know what you have in and of their own. That's tens of millions of quarter per large company in savings. And then beyond there though, because they have visibility across all the supply chain, they actually, they can say, you are ordering XYZ parts at the wrong time. Do you know that your vendors have these rebates if you shift your buying behavior by this much? So there is not just the cleaning element, which is a huge problem, but also the optimization element um, that occurs. So this is a local company here on one of the Peach Streets. <laughs> um, but incredibly powerful. I mean, like they have Georgia Pacific and Southern and big, big AP embed, like huge um, uh, customers on their roster precisely because this data piece has business outcome impact that's uh, you know, in, in the millions in that regard. So that's one thing, area to think about. Completely on a different facet. One of the challenges is what we have with the data and how decisions get made, the, the painting analogy, is we don't really understand how these algorithms around deep learning make their decisions. So think about this. I'm driving. I've decided to change lanes. I'm going to move, I don't know, to the right. Um, have any of you ever thought how you sequence your process? Because I haven't. I don't know. Sometimes I look to the left, I look to the main mirror, I turn the signal, oh, wait, I wait, or no, I don't. We're making split decisions. Our brain does not work like AI, but it's a good proxy. Like, none of us, we make those decisions multiple times a day for anything. None of us can actually articulate how we sequence it because there are different neurons and different parts of our brains involved in those decisions. Akin to that, but very differently, Neural, these nodes in the neural nets of AI are doing something similar in terms of their, you know, engagement. And so if you read about lack of transparency in AI or explainability, that's what they're speaking about. We don't know, um, you know, why was Bill offered the job when the AI screened the resume, but I wasn't. Was it my capabilities? Was it the data I was trained? How did it make the decision? It's going to become a huge compliance problem. In fact, it is. So we incubated a business to solve this for, for compliance. But point being, you know, explainability around algorithms is an interesting area to watch if, as, as AI becomes more adopted. And like MIT in February of last year came up with this technique called Milan. So for vision, and Milan is the abbre abbreviation, we now have actually some breakthroughs in understanding how each node in this neural nets in, in image recognition is making decisions. That's going to help with adoption because then we can ensure we know how decisions are made, we can protect them, we can tweak them. The other thing to keep in mind is that at the current stage of AI adoption, it's a human in the loop. And you spoke to this at the very beginning. Uh, you know, when, when you talk about the, the check mark, right, you know, we're selecting pictures to verify ourselves. For, for the CAPTCHA, that's actually human in the loop. You do it all the time. If on Amazon you're doing any kind of rating, that's a human in the loop. We're training the algorithm. If you're watching Netflix and you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down, that's a human in the loop. We're actually training these models by providing our feedback nonstop all day long, unbeknownst to us with our consumer hats on. So like you said, we're all participants in this process, knowing we are not. Wonderful. A dialogue. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll, we'll ask one uh, one more question and then turn it over to you if you, you have any um, questions for, for these experts. Um, Rudina, wh where are you most excited to be investing? I mean, is it a sector like healthcare like you were talking about? It seems like you're, you're into everything. 
or, or is no, it no, no, I'm not. I, I, you are I, most excited. I, I think pride in, in the things that I say no to more than the things <laughs> I say yes to because it, you have to be disciplined. For me, I think the application layer of Gen AI I think would be later at that point, but I'm particularly interested in driving optimization of efficiency in various industries rather than just sort of some improvement. So as you probably noted from the examples, manufacturing, um, insurance tech, some of those verticals are prime for, for disruption and value creation. Um, data infrastructure, that's an area, how do we make the data cheaper, better, faster, um, very tangible, the budgets are there. Productivity um, of the enterprise, that typically lends itself naturally to by department. So we have a company called Reprise, it's spelled Reprise, but the founders um, always pronounce it as Reprise and you take their lead in these things. So Reprise, um, they've automated the demo function of any software, and it's not just for tech, although you know all the big tech players are now, for the most part, customers. You can be a bank, you can be anyone taking away this need for sales engineering support, for the demo crashing as the customer um, tries to play with it and all that. So how do you drive that kind of productivity? And then around the security side, um, IAM, Identity Access Management, we hinted at some of it. I think Patrick and can probably weigh in from tech operators. Shout out to our good friends here. Um, so you know that, that's an area, third party risk. Um, continues to be an area, especially as the security surface um, continues to expand, and then compliance and um, privacy, but compliance privacy is never made money, we talk about it, but somehow we're all willing to forego it. So it's really more of the regulatory and compliance side of things around what code do you have that's AI, what data are you using, how can you have traceability to make sure as regulations come about. So I would say those are probably the buckets that I'm most excited about sort of in the, in the industry. And then looking a little bit farther out, so call it 10 years out, I think human machine interfaces, we've crossed that first um, barrier around now machines interacting or software interacting with us in a human-like manner, but where does that go? How does biology and that come together? What can we do around healthcare? I do not invest in healthcare. I come very close to it, but stay out. But I think there will be a crossing of the chasm that occurs in that regard between AI and synthetic enhancements. Don't be scared and do not think it has anything to do with beauty. Uh, it has to do with our um, computation, but technically, he laughed, somebody got the joke. Uh, but think about diseases, particularly brain generative diseases, and what, what can we do? And, and there are a lot of ethical questions around that. We want to do that. You know, when does the human begin? When does the machine begin? And will there will we create a new class in society? But those are farther out. We have a lot more pressing enterprise challenges that we can solve now. All right. Well, please give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Questions from, from you, Kathy. You'll have to forgive the structure of this because I really don't have the vocabulary. But it just seems to me that when you're talking about this industry in general, you have to have humans interacting and participating in some way in order to get a, an ultimate result. So, is there is this? industry gender neutral? I mean, are the results unbiased regardless of whether uh, you're, I love the difference, look at this. <laughs> I will give you my answer and I ask in advance to be forgiven because unfortunately this all of a sudden takes political um, coloring. Um, no. Um, is the resounding answer. Amazon, this, so in 2000 and either 17 or 18, I wrote this article for Taconomy um, called Is AI Male? Um, have you ever looked at your, gentlemen, please forgive me, have you looked at your tools, Siri, support function, woman. IBM Watson, guiding function, men. Technology reflects our cultural construct and how it gets done, but Amazon, 
went completely AI native in the first um, filtering of resumes. And shockingly or not, the candidates that made it without any human intervention to the next level were male, white, and Indian background uh, because they looked at uh, historical data. Banks have this huge issue that when they're leveraging, and, and insurance companies as well, regulatory issue, this is a big issue, when they're leveraging um, models that have been trained on historical data, typically single moms, especially <coughs> non-white single moms, get denied. You can overlay any point of view from its bias to it was fair. I'm not going to weigh on that. I think you understand this to where I said, but um, but it's a real problem, and that ties to explainability, and that's on the data and the historical side. You also have to think about who's coding back to the operating system. Who's coding these models? Because if it's one, whether it's social strata, background, if it's homogeneous. Just on the, along the gender, our brains don't work the same way. And if they're coded one way by a certain profile or set of profiles that's homogeneous, it's really problematic. <coughs> I'm, a, I'm a mother of a daughter. I work, and I, I'm part of making the future. I'd like to argue while well, generating outsized returns, one hopes. But like, you know, I worry about these things. You know, um, mother first, uh, uh, VC second. So how do we set those boundaries? Now, regulation is always late, but it's, in the pendulum of it being late, it's come earlier, or the awareness. Like we have the awareness of what's going on with AI at the regulatory level way, way earlier than we did with social, for example. Cambridge Analytica happened decades after the Facebooks and the Instagrams of the world had come about. So I think there is a lot more sensitivity around here. We also have a lot more research that's going into explainability, as I talked about. So I'm cautiously optimistic, but equally worry, worry about what's happening. And again, for, for my firm, we firmly, for example, will not invest in a company that uses image recognition at an individual level. Not because that company in and of its own um, would be bad. I mean, we've ensured that from governance board seats and all that. But I worry about state control and countries that can get hold of those types of technologies. And I will not be part of that. Imagine a, a dictatorial state. That's a real problem. You have complete and utter control of the individual. So more than you want it. No. Yes. Plenty. <laughs> And I want to take your question generalizing because this is something I talk with students about all the time. Uh, so bias is a mathematical term. It just means group A, group B, there's a difference. And then the, the big question is, is that difference explainable in a way that we say is fair or not? Now, the bias that gets the attention, of course, gender bias, racial bias, et cetera. But mathematically, there's no difference in investigating that than anything else. And so the key is, and she already hinted at it, any model of any type will perpetuate any embedded bias, whether intentional, unintentional, mistakes, et cetera, simply because that's what it's gonna predict from. Even data that is actually factual, you have to ask yourself, is it still okay? So let's take, uh, I, I always use tuition, like uh, marijuana legalization. If we had a model that would give judges guidance on how to sentence people for a marijuana sentence using the last 20 years of data, for example, on the surface that sounds really phenomenal, except We've, we've lowered the penalty so much that the average of those 20 years will be much harsher than we intended to be. And then you can find on the, on the counter side areas that we've really cracked down on that would be too light. So even when data, and this is one thing around ethics uh, you have to think about, it's not just you have to validate that your data is unbiased in general and ethical today for the use you're going to use it. But you also have to consider as you move forward, is there an expiration date on that? Or has something changed, whether legally, societal views, or um, uh, you know, like a whole new set of products came out that replaced your old ones, and so that old data is almost virtually irrelevant. You have to continuously reassess that. And this is no different. So there's a, uh, uh, examples abound, like uh, in the early days of, of image recognition, uh, a model that identified wild wolves versus husky dogs like pets and did it with amazing accuracy and then they did some of the early stage of reverse engineering how did they come to the conclusion and you know what it was the part of the image it was the snow 
because most wild wolves are photographed in the snow and your dog is in a living room in a backyard very rarely in the snow and so ironically the model was incredibly effective and was in fact accurate at identifying wolves versus huskies but the reason it was doing so had absolutely nothing that really made it a legitimate model for the purpose that we would have done it and so that's an example where you had real data the data didn't have bias but there was an unexpected factor in there that once you look at it you go wow well it wouldn't be fair to use this model so in hospital scenarios a children's hospital's MRI, everyone puts their little, they have a little logo or it might have, each machine has its own nuances and you had models that were predicting cancer very effectively, but what it ended up, it just learned that anything with the film output that looks this way is more likely to have cancer. Well, that's because it's a children's cancer hospital. <laughs> you know, it's not that this image itself was a higher chance of cancer. So there's all these unintended weird nuances to this and it's, I mean, it, I've probably gone on too long, but you, it, it gets deep. It's like layer after layer, and that's why it's so difficult. Uh, sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, I, this may not be a simple answer, but within a company, what are some characteristics of a department or process that's right for AI to optimize? Oh. How, how do you identify a project? So I think the, the, the key is it. I'll give you a little anecdote, and this is a true story. So one of my, my chief analytics officer friends was telling me about three years ago, I think I wrote a blog on this even, without identifying him for reasons that will soon be apparent. Um, this was the early days of AI. He goes, yeah, I just find I'm spending all my time, though, it's so frustrating. All these business partners are coming to me now, and they want to solve this and that problem with AI, and I have to spend all my time explaining to them why this isn't appropriate for AI. And I said, man, you're making a huge mistake. What do you mean? I said, well, Pretty much everyone I talk to, and including in my past, our complaint has been our business partners don't come to us enough, and we're hope, we're trying to get them to partner with us more to bring us problems. I said, what you just told me is your business partners are bringing you their real problems, asking you to solve them, and instead of saying, hey, I'll find a way to solve that problem for them, you cold, throw cold water on it, now they're never going to come back. So my point is, and this was in my prediction yesterday, but the problem I'm still seeing a lot of companies, because this is so hot, their goal is we want to do something with generative AI, let's go try and find a use case for it. You always got to start with, I have this problem I need to solve. Here's the data I have, here's the business issues, here's the value. Now, what's the best way to solve it? And if you find, you know what, given these specs, AI is a perfect thing, then go after it. But I wouldn't start with, I want to do AI and find this problem. I'm not saying you're suggesting, I'm saying in general, just keep that in mind. It, I think it's the classic thing. You need to be prioritizing the most important business problems that you need to solve, that you think data and analytics of some kind can solve. And some of those will, in, will, will inevitably bubble up to be AI, but many fewer than people are trying to solve today with AI because people want it on their resume that they solve some problems with AI. The same thing as with the early days of big data. Everyone wanted to implement a big data system, et cetera, et cetera, so they have it on their, their resume. So it's a, matter, a little bit of a matter of, uh, of, of back to the basics. I think I'm saying how do I know AI is the right solution when I have business so uh, I'll build, I think it's the sequencing is exactly right, but yeah, to, to um, continue riffing on that, um, the characteristics of it is one, your run-of-the-mill software doesn't solve the problem, yet, or at least not with a sufficient amount of impact and improvement to make it worthwhile. If you generally have data that's well-structured, so structured or semi-structured data, a nice place to, to sort of start there. If, um, if you can get sort of adoption um, uh, relatively easily, really important. I'll give you um, a, a concrete example. So one of my partners in my firm is the former chief scientist for Kurzweil AI, but also after that for nearly 20 years, the CTO and head of AI at Nuance, which was acquired by Microsoft for nearly 20 billion. They, they did a lot of AI and speech recognition and natural language understanding, particularly for the healthcare industry and hospitals. So one of the things, one of the apps that they developed was around uh, transcribing of doctor's notes. So doctors are recording and you have these transcribers and they're doing all that thing. And this guy's got an app that was somewhere around 80% accurate. You think, awesome, not quite so much. It turned out that these folks, they had gotten so good and doing it the old fashioned way, that that 70, 80% accuracy slowed everything down. It just didn't 
it wasn't good enough because they had to go and correct the wrong words and it was an entirely new skill set. So they had to go back to the drawing board and say, what does it have to do? So they hit 90 something percent and all of a sudden it was landscape changing. So it's about how much of an improvement does it deliver? Um, it's, um, is it inherently fitting in the value chain or are you, ch you know, so there was behavior change. How does it fit in the value chain? Um, and how quickly are you going to able to generate a return from an ROI product perspective? So if someone says, oh, do this and everyone be ha will be happy, not so much. Go back to the fundamentals of what's my input, what's my output, and it will become evident. So to make it concrete, development organizations, ripe for Copilot. I have no company in my portfolio. I think the air that's coding from scratch I and mean, doing AI from scratch. Um, I think on average, we're somewhere 60 to 63 percent is the latest we, we've seen where the initial majority of the code can be generated. And then the secret sauce is really what the senior developers come and, and overlay. That's a meaningful cost saving in any organization because we think of developers as a tech thing, but uh, who do I think? JP Morgan Chase has 40,000 developers in its organization. So everyone has developers in this instance, so industry-wide type um, impact. You also have to ask the question, speaking of impact, of who am I driving an efficiency for? Generative AI, incredible at content generation. You will automate, drum roll your marketing interns. Who cares, $20 an hour? What can you do for your chief investment officer? What can you do for the high, high cost, high you know, impact people? Or if you are in the, I'm trying to project, I don't know what your backgrounds are, but if you're in the wealth management space and you're delivering white glove service, what can you develop something once, distribute it to others, do so more at scale, and therefore either maintain the white glove service and expand it to the number of people you can deliver it, or bring the cost down. So it has to be on those areas. So do not let the three letter acronyms that we throw your way overwhelm you. Do ask the fundamental questions of how am I making money. But structured data, really a nice hint. Um, if you can't solve it with run of the mill software, why? And what's so special? And at a minimum, ask your organizations or your tech folks the question, what architecture and model are you uh, using and what technique? Even if the mumbo jumbo they throw your way goes right above your head, the point is it's important to ask that question because we will have a dot com, dot bubble, uh, you know, a boom and bubble type situation or, you know, other tech corrections because we are too shy to ask the questions that will make us look down of the more junior people. I don't think so. Ask it. All right, we will, um, I think we'll just take one more uh, based on the time. Um, we've got a lot of exciting hands, sir. Oh, me? Yeah, please. Yeah, so um, one of the questions I would have regarding AI is, you know, <coughs> these models get more advanced and they're getting trained up. Um, what are the risks of us actually seeing disruptions, much like how we uh, saw disruptions in markets during the early algorithms? <coughs> you know, um, so basically, you know, the markets would be all chaotic when Alga started to come to light, and they started to break certain breakers to protect that. But is there still that risk to come back again as AI starts to advance itself that we're gonna start seeing mishaps in the markets again with, with these models? So I, I am not a good, I don't have domain expertise in the public markets, but so I, I'm assuming like you're thinking about the frequency trading and that kind yeah, of, so, yeah, yeah, so, uh, I don't have domain expertise. Take it with a drain of this. So I will give you my two cents, but I think you should heavily discount it, possibly. And that's where regulation is going to come into play. That there will be opportunities for arbitrage, for sure. Because in addition, the reason why you had high frequency trading emerge is because of computational power. You could do it faster than the humans. Therefore, you know, you could arbitrage there. Now you can do it faster than the human, even faster, and with some intelligence. Yeah. So that is that combination, a, a consumer's view. So layman to layman, because it's not my domain, tells me there, it's, there, something will happen there for good, something will go away, and then we will respond. But it will not be something that I expect we will get ahead of and prevent. As human nature has it, it will be more of a response. But that's not a well-educated answer at all.
Yeah. I'll say, I, I talk about the flash crash in 2010 live because that was kind of the the, the, the public face of algorithmic trading gone bad. Um, so the good news out of that, and this is the example I, 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 I use moving forward, is that, uh, so my second book was called The Analytics Revolution. It was about the industrial nature and the scaling of all these analytics and the automation and the new risks that come. So for example, that was the early days of algorithmic trading. So there's things the algorithm might start to do wrong, and then there's the fact that you let it keep doing that wrong thing without any circuit breakers or other checks. And I think there's circuit breakers and checks put on top of those algorithms today. AI may come up with a different set of logic for why it wants to go do a certain trade or price something a certain way, but those same fundamental kind of circuit breakers that are already in place should, should in many cases still catch that. It'll still recognize, well, wait a minute, you're suggesting I go buy 10x what I normally do at double the price? No, that you know that's going to need a, a human review or something. So I think there is some risk, but I think that it, that that's an area that has been so so well handled from a risk perspective in terms of the various people and automated uh, interventions that there there will be something that slips through somewhere possibly, but I don't think it will be as bad as those early days when literally no one thought through the death spiral that happened as algorithms traded off with each other in real time and within a half hour before anyone knew what happened, they had crashed everything. Yeah. Oh, Regina Cesare, Bill Franks, thank you very much. And thank you all. <laughs>